When I saw this for sale on eBay, I just had to pick it up because it's the first time I've seen one of these since 1986 and I'd forgotten all about it. It's a personal stereo, which is all normal enough. However, it's a personal stereo with a built-in television. And yet, it's not that much larger than many of the personal stereos that were around at the time. The thing that really gives it away is this big aerial on the side though. Now the way the screen works, well it's not that grey section there, that's just the way the light gets to the screen. The screen is actually viewed off this mirror in the bottom and the LCD is contained within the top section. So the light goes through that panel there, lights up the LCD screen which is then reflected off the mirror in the bottom. In addition to the cassette player and the television, this device also has a built-in AM-FM radio. Now this is one of only two personal stereos that came out with a built-in television. This particular model is from Sharp, it's the JC-AV1, and the alternative device came out around the same time, and that was from JVC. By opting to go for that reflective LCD technology, they're able to power this whole device off just a couple of AA batteries. If they'd gone for some sort of backlight technology on the LCD, it would have ate through those batteries in a few minutes. As far as the cassette mechanism goes, it's pretty mid-range for the era. We've got auto-reverse, we're able to select between metal or normal tapes, but I notice there's no selector switch to turn Dolby on and off. One thing that was slightly unusual about it is the way the cassettes go into it. The head of the machine is contained within the hinge of the door as you can see there. So when you put the cassette in you slide it down onto that and it holds it on the door and then you close the door on top of the spindles. And just a quick tip here, if you ever do find an old sharp personal stereo and you put new batteries in it and press play and nothing happens, do not throw it away. It's more than likely using the same cutoff mechanism as this one. This will only work once it's got the headphones plugged into it. And the reason they've done that will have been to save on your batteries. If you don't have your headphones plugged in, you don't want to be using it, so you don't want to accidentally switch it on whilst carrying it around in your pocket and run your batteries down. I think that's something I probably did quite a few times back in the day. Now, unfortunately, when you put the television on, of course, there's nothing to see on there. It does do UHF and VHF, but they've switched off the analog television signals in the UK, so I've got nothing at all that I can show you on this. However, I do have a way that I can get around that. But the first thing I need to do is relocate to the conservatory because I need the light that comes through the ceiling of this to be able to show that screen properly. Now this particular device doesn't have any kind of video inputs, it just receives it over that antenna. So I can't plug an RCA cable into this, so instead I'll need to transmit something to it that it can pick up on that aerial. And to do that I'm using this. This is an old fashioned video sender. These things were outlawed in the 1990s because of the interference they gave out. And before you call the Rosas on me, let me just say that I'm only going to use it for a few minutes to demonstrate this device with because it's cutting off the Wi-Fi in my house anyway. Now the way this works is you put a composite video signal into this, it transmits it out over that aerial just like the television broadcast antenna would do but over a short distance of course and then it's picked up by the television. First things first, I cannot say for definite that this is the same level of contrast that you would have got on the screen when the device was first out because LCDs can fade over time. I can say though that back then then they would have been having the same problem that I'm having now. And that's trying to get the right angle to view the screen without getting the door in the way, but also getting the light to go through the door at the angle that it reflects perfectly back off that mirror. The angle of view really is very unforgiving. And this will be a familiar sight to anyone that ever tried using a portable television. Trying to get a decent signal on them was always problematic, and when you were indoors it was quite often impossible. But then on top of that, you've got the added level of complication that comes along with this kind of screen technology because more often than not, you wouldn't be able to see it properly indoors because you wouldn't have enough light going through that panel on the top. And then you've also got to watch out for reflections. This line across the middle of the screen, well, it's not on the image, it's just a reflection off the top panel. But you might have thought that this device would have just won through on coolness. After all, you've got a cassette player, a radio and a television all in something that you can slide into your inside pocket. But it came out in 1986 and that was the era when a lot was going on with personal stereos. This is the model that I wanted back in 1986. Five band graphic equaliser, inline remote control, slim logic controls. That was the kind of thing that I was interested in back then. The fact that you could get a television on one didn't really appeal to me because after 
after all, you could hardly watch it anywhere. And it didn't help that colour portable LCD screens had been on the market since 1985. The model you see here, I bought this one in 1987, and I could hardly pick anything up on it, and when I could, the picture quality was terrible, but at least it was supposed to be in colour. So this device was only on the market for a very short amount of time and of course that is why I've featured it here today in this video because those are the things that I like, the kind of failures that people have forgotten. To me this device perfectly encapsulates 1986, a period in time in which consumer electronics companies were trying to outdo each other to come up with the latest and greatest piece of technology. Nowadays, if you wanted to watch a video or listen to music on the go, you'd probably just use a smartphone, but I think it's good to look back every now and then just to see how far we've come. Anyway, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.